So welcome everyone on our discussion panel. Uh, today we would like to uh, discuss how to uh, reach press with uh, your very best precious game you made or you are making right now, which is not the very easiest uh, task to do these days when uh, dozens of, of games are launching almost every day. So all of the games fighting for attention of press, attention of players, and we try to answer what's the best, best route to, to make it. So today we are having a, a game developers here on stage. We are having a, a guys from media and we are having guys from a, a PR agencies. And I think we start from introduction. Rob, if you could start and introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm uh, Rob Hearn. Uh, I'm the managing editor for Steel Media, which is the, the company that owns Pocket Gamer and One Prairie Apps and various other websites. I'm Audra McIver. I'm the strategic commander for Plan of Attack. Uh, we do PR and marketing for video games. Hi, I'm Tadeusz Zieliński. I'm a community manager and project manager for CD Projekt Red. Um, I'm James Kay. I'm co-founder of Demoso. Um, we're a PR marketing agency and we work a lot with uh, mobile game developers to help them self-publish their games. And I am Radoslav Jaroszek, uh, Editor-in-Chief of GRI on FPL. Um, my name is Daniel Mischkel. Uh, I'm founder of Tapit Games, a developer studio from, from Krakow. Okay, thank you. So I think we start this discussion from uh, really beginning. So. When is the good moment to, to start to send out your, your first message to media? Is it worth to, to wait until very, very late when the, the game is almost finished? Or is it better to, to start showing your, your concepts? So this is the first question. When, when, to, when to start? I'll, 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 I'll take that one. Um, I think from a mobile perspective, timing is um, very important. I think that the, the challenge with mobile is that there's the immediacy, the I want it now. So if you promote something to do with a game you've got, you've got to make sure that you can capture that person via social media or somewhere else that you're going to keep hold of them. Because I think what happens with mobile is someone sees a game and their first reaction is that they'll go and look for it at that moment on the app store and if they can't find it, they might just forget about it. So I definitely think that with promoting mobile games, there is absolutely an advantage even months ahead to start teasing people with materials as long as you're using social media so that you can actually keep hold of the people and let them know what's happening. Um, anyway, that's it for me. <laughs> I, I actually want to jump in here. I completely agree with you. And uh, one of the really important things about mobile games is when the reviews come out for a mobile game, you want to make sure mm -hmm. that people can read the review and then go and immediately download it. So it's very important if you're uh, doing a review campaign before you launch a mobile game, you want to embargo the reviews so that they hit the day that the game launches and that when people read those reviews, they can go in and download it immediately. Okay, thank you. And oh. is um, it... Sorry, one... <laughs> for good luck. Uh, one little advice for independent uh, developer, for my uh, point of view, would be uh, use so-called uh, dead seasons in, in our terminology. For example, after E3 or after Games Developers Conference, after uh, Gamescom, there's like two or three weeks that uh, actually nothing happens. We don't get any uh, new materials from uh, game developers, from big publishers. Uh, uh, on the E3, they uh, send us everything they, they had, uh, every trailer, every piece of information they had. So after these main events, after these, uh, these uh, big shows, uh, use this time uh, wisely, send us some uh, information from you guys, and we gladly accept it, because uh, then we actually uh, have to find some stories to, to write on our, on our own. 
Okay, and uh, you said, James and Audrey, that, that it's, it's good to build awareness of the game early on. The question is, uh, isn't that media focus very much, especially for mobile games, on the, on the launches, when, when the game is nearly out, like in a week or two, isn't that this is the most interesting thing for media? Rob, what, what do you think about it? I, I would say the best way to build up a mobile game is similar to the best way to build up a, a digital download title nowadays, which is assets and especially video. Um, if you have something really visual that people can look at, then a lot of readers will see that and be interested in it and then maybe tag it so that they can follow it or, or make a note of it. Uh, yeah, definitely visual assets, for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I also think in terms of um, when you're pitching stuff to journalists and getting things on their radar, uh, video is equally important for that because actually it's a really good way of filtering, you know, just from information or screenshots. You know, they, they can be quite misleading or not especially informative where, not, you know, 99 uh, times out of 100 will just gravitate towards trailers. And if there's no trailers, that's a pretty good reason for us to just ignore a press release entirely. Um, you know, there's so many reasons to ignore a press release, but one of them is if there's no trailer in it, definitely. Yes, I, actually I think that right now in the times of YouTube uh, and basically video media, the, the, the good trailer is half of your success. I'd say, for example, Crawl is a good example. It was nominated like at the beginning of the year, it was already nominated the best trailer of 2014. And actually, there was like what a little gameplay in it, and the good music and some good text. And so, if you have a good idea for the for the trailer, like a like a something original, that could work out really well. Okay, so would we all agree that the video materials are much more interesting for press than any of anything else? Uh, well, I mean, it, it goes along with information as well. You don't want it to be just video, but that, I think that's the single most important ingredient. Uh, especially these days, but I mean, it, it depends very much on the game. Um, sometimes video is not ready, so it can be quite effective. Uh, one one developer got in touch with me recently, and I don't got the impression that he had anything to show, so he just sent me a picture of a horse. And the subject line of the email was, "Here's a picture of a horse." You know, and I couldn't resist. You know, I I, I replied seven out of ten, because you know. So now I'm going to be, you know. When he does have something to show me, I'll be aware of him, and I'll, I'm sort of friends with him now, kind of, so to speak, even though I've never met him. Um, so it's not just about that. And sometimes you don't have it ready, and you do also need other information, but yeah, it's definitely a very important part of the, the whole thing. Okay, thanks. And, uh, well, for sure, you're getting, uh, like, you know, uh, a lot of these video materials uh, each day. How to, how to actually... De you know, deliver our materials. I mean, I'm saying from my point of view of developer, how to you know interest the press, the the the, the, the media guy that he even opened the link. You know, how how the how, how the message should be constructed. Shall, shall we use I don't know a form of newsletter or form of a, you know personal message if we know this 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 media person or maybe something else. Um, and so uh, how to do it with a casual game, because this is the real challenge here, because core games, they, uh, they get a lot of attention for, from players and from media, because they're core games, basically, and, uh, and it's extremely difficult to reach out to uh, and reach people in media with casual games, so how do you do that? Uh, but uh, again, one uh, little advice for every uh, indie developer. If you uh, communicate with us, journalists, please uh, send us a complete package. Uh, please, it's not important if it's video, it's uh, screenshots or whatever other materials, but don't uh, make us look for it in the internet. We are not lazy, we are just overflown with information. We have a lot of stuff to process during the day. We are overflown with uh, gaming data from uh, different sources. So please send us a complete package, your logo, your uh, screenshots, uh, at least a link to your YouTube profile. And also, um, if you are an indie developer, uh, send us uh, your photo. Uh, for example, in Onet, uh, our users really enjoy seeing the faces behind uh, a product. That you are real people, there is a real story behind your game. You are, you are not a bot, you are a real person. So tell us your story, send us your photos. Uh, I would say that there is one more thing, but even before you send assets, 
prepare them well. I mean, that should be like a triple A quality. You should really, really look at what you're doing. You, th you should think of the features of your game that are really appealing, that they are original, uh, they outstand in a way. Uh, and with that, with that package, with something that's really outstanding out of you know other games that are on the market, that will really, really help you get to the to the medium. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the quality of materials is always the, the most important one. That's why we are spending really a, a days or weeks working on screenshots or video materials. But uh, another question maybe is that coming back to uh, video materials, is it uh, better to maybe invest uh, a lot of money in CGI trailers? Or maybe it's players, or maybe uh, uh, you know, players, users, readers like to see how the game really look like, looks like, and maybe it's better to, to create any kind of uh, uh, game footage. Absolutely, we want uh, game gameplay footage. We sort of big fancy trailers are kind of all very well as part of a broader marketing strategy or whatever. But in terms of um, the journalists' kind of selection strategies. Uh, we definitely want to just see gameplay. It's actually quite frustrating if a, if a trailer doesn't have gameplay in it. Sometimes you, know, you can take a mix, but every so often you get a trailer and it's just CGI stuff or it's just teaser stuff. Uh, and that's actually quite frustrating. We need to just actually see what the game looks like. And I imagine it's the same for, for our readers as well. I imagine they just want to know how it plays. So you're saying it's like the, the CGI trailer, you know, building the image, but not saying the game, how the game looks like, right? I think the, the CGI stuff, um, you know, that might tell them something else about the game. It might tell, if, you know, if it's, a really, if it's a trailer with really high production values, then that sends a message about how, what the likely production values of the game are likely to be. So it, it's a kind of a, it's a softer thing, but, uh, you know, in terms of, like, directly getting the message across, you, we just want to see gameplay, which isn't to say you shouldn't do more uh, kind of theatrical-type trailers, but gameplay, I think, is the most important thing. But I, I feel like the, the CGI trailers as well, they're, they're quite expensive to make and they don't really actually communicate that much about the game. I feel like it's kind of a, a, a triple A, more of a triple A type of tactic to pull in um, attention based on a really nice cinematic trailer. But I, but I, I think that gameplay, if, if, especially if you're a, an indie on a limited budget, stick to straight gameplay and just make it look nice, but make it look realistic to the game. Because that's what people are going to be playing, and it's more interesting. It's not like they're watching it on a screen at E3 or on TV or something like that. I think gameplay footage is is probably the most interesting if you're actually trying to pull in players. I, I, I mean, I, I think as a, a gamer myself, I spent years being subject to... Um to CGI trailing. So I think everyone who's a gamer here, which is most people, would know they're actually incredibly frustrating. You're hoping to see something, you know, and it's lovely seeing Blizzard's latest high production value CGI trailer. But ultimately, every gamer feels a sense of frustration with a 100% CGI trailer. I don't, I don't know if there's anyone here that loves them, and, but you, you just you want to see gameplay ultimately. Exactly, especially when if you see a, a really nice cinematic trailer and you go into the game and it's yeah. nothing like that, it's a bit frustrating. You can shoot yeah. yourself in the foot. <laughs> and a, about, I don't know, 30 seconds of gameplay give you more impression about the game uh, than a uh, 30 minutes long uh, cinematic trailer. And also from the technical standpoint, like making a CGI trailer is a chore. It's expensive, as you said. Uh, it's very hard to do. And right now the quality of CGI trailers is so high that it's, I don't really believe that, that any indie developer is able by himself to achieve the same level of quality. So it's just not wise to try to compete with the blizzards of this world and, and to try to, to, to put in your own CGI something. Because that would be more of a CGI something, I'd say. Yes, exactly. I, I, I think they shouldn't compare themselves to a CD Projekt, for example, and compete with uh, Baginski because uh, now they have so many more opportunities to be visible in the media. So they should use uh, other sources, but I think this is the next uh, question some, sometimes later. It's basically the same thing as I said about Crawl. It's a game of few screens and some pixels. I, actually, I think that putting pixels in the game also works as, as a charm right now. If you put, make a pixel art graphic, it will just sell. Uh, but 
they made a fantastic trailer out of almost nothing, just voice and some scenes. So it's gameplay, pure gameplay trailer, and it works perfectly. Okay, so I guess we all agree that uh, CGI trailer is good to have, nice to have, but not essential, and when you when you can afford it. So um, the maybe next question is. Uh, is there any major differences in approach between uh, mobile games, casual games, AAA console games, and what uh, each uh, developers can can learn each other from 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 different uh, from different platforms? Uh, you're asking if, if there's a difference, a big difference between the way that you launch different types of games. Yeah, what's the difference, you know, approaching the media, or maybe? starting point of the campaign be between a mobile game, between a, a casual game, or between AAA console game? Uh, there is definitely a, a difference. The, the mobile game, and, and I definitely look for your um, uh, opinion as well, but a, a mobile game has a much shorter launch time frame generally than a console title or even a PC title because Generally speaking, unless it's a really core mobile game, you're not going to do a preview campaign. So a preview campaign adds another element, um, which also adds more time, um, but it's also very beneficial. And I definitely uh, look, look for the uh, opinion of you who, who do mostly mobile games. I, I, I feel like it's a, a definitely a shorter launch time frame than a AAA game. And AAA games, by the way, uh, the digital download has, has definitely shortened the launch time frame across the board from what it was five, ten, or even five years ago. Uh, it's definitely a shorter launch cycle now. Yeah, I, I feel in, in mobile and the titles that I've worked on, um, the ones that the ones that you know you want to get on to Touch Arcade and Slide to Play and One Four Eight and hopefully Pocket Gamer. Um, the, 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 you know, the puzzle games, the more casual games, you, for some reason you just don't get as much traction. I think also the other point is you want that level of engagement, you want that level of buzz and interest um, beyond the media. And I think um, if you take something like your current title, Godfire, um, which has extremely high production values and is getting people excited. That's something where you, I, you know, I can see on Touch Arcade on the forums, you get you know quite a lot of animated discussion and chat, and you want that buzz. You know, you want to create the the, the hype, and it, I just think it happens that the the for want of a better phrase, the mid-core to hardcore games are going to get that kind of following, where it's going to go beyond just the media that you're appearing on. I mean, I mean, even two years ago, be, before we launched Real Boxing, the same year we launched a couple of uh, casual games, and it was so hard to, to, to bring any attention from, from press. It was another casual games which are, which are great, but not maybe enough great. And when we launched uh, Real Boxing together, James, <laughs> there was so, it was so different. I mean, the, the, the coverage we, we got for first first few, few uh, media messages was enormous. It was because the, the game just outstand from, from the crowd. Maybe because we, we done a, a CGI trailer as well and maybe because we made this uh, uh, I think uh, much longer campaign than usual on mobile games. We started uh, at Gamescom and we launched on, on uh, uh, mid-November, so it was like four months campaign, which is not maybe super long, but it's it's still long enough for, for mobile games. So I mean, the, again, we are in the point that the quality of the game is comes first. I think um, in the case of a game like that, I, I also think it's about just knowing that the, a lot of members of the press will be familiar with that. Uh, you know, they're all. Well, a lot of them are people of a certain age who played the original on, on the Amiga, and so uh, you know, in choosing which games to kind of take to the press, I think it's important to, to pick your targets and to know that you know cer certain journalists like certain kinds of games, and a lot of journalists will be very familiar with Speedball. So I think it was just it was just the game itself and the the license that that helps uh, in in that 
instant, possibly even more than you know any other promotional activity that you did. It's possible. I'm not saying that you wasted your money doing it, but I think even if you hadn't done that, I think it would have gained a certain amount of uh, uh, attention anyway, just because it was speedball too. Personally, that would be my take. Uh, in case of IP strength is a big. If you if you have a strong IP, you're building off of that. Changes the game a little bit as well. And if you have a match three, which is not Candy Crush Saga, what do you do? I'm sorry? If you have match three game, which is not Candy Crush Saga, what do you do? Um, I, I would say that you need to just kind of go... Uh, what we would do first off would be to target journalists that clearly liked that genre of game. And not just Candy Crush Saga, because obviously that's huge, and everyone loves it or maybe doesn't. Um, but you really need to know who you're pitching games to. You don't want to pitch a, a, a free-to-play endless runner to a journalist that always uh, reviews them poorly, because they clearly don't like those games. Different people like different types of games. They're just like everything else. So you, you want to know who you're pitching, and you want to know the audience you're going after, but you definitely want to know who you're pitching. Yeah, with AAA titles, it's kind of both easier and harder in the same moment, because from one side, you basically dispose of an IP that sells itself, so everybody knows it, so it's enough that you announce that you are doing something with that IP, and everybody will buzz about it, and everybody will talk about it. On the other hand, you have to schedule a, a full campaign uh, that takes a year, sometimes two years, or a year and a half. Uh, in case of AAA companies, you have a whole team that works just on that. They, their only occupation is planning, scheduling, and, and, and executing the campaign. In case of an of a indie developer, you most likely one, two, three people who are working on a title. So I'd say it's wiser to get into development and develop your game really well and have it, like, that would be the easiest question to uh, answer, like the overarching question, what to do to reach your, 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 with your game to reach a journalist, to make a fantastic game. That's, that's the best thing that you can, that you can do. Mm -hmm. If yes. you have a good game, it'll sell. Yes, of course, but uh, if we are talking about targeting journalists, the, the common problem is, uh, especially when we're talking about PR agencies and uh, large uh, publishers, that almost every email, al almost every press release uh, uh, looks exactly the same. Uh, my people have to dug up through so much uh, marketing uh, crap, uh, so their job is sometimes uh, digging through the information and from the two uh, pages and 2,000 words of uh, marketing information, they dug up like uh, two sentences which are actual information from these uh, developers. And I know it's hard to convince uh, PR agencies or big uh, companies to uh, do it uh, differently and to target specific uh, journalists and, make se and uh, write, write separate emails to every uh, journalist. But if you are independent developer, you can do it, yeah? you should have uh, some uh, marketing strategy. Uh, a common mistake um, uh, with uh, independent developer is that they don't have this business attitude. I don't mean they don't have, a, we don't expect from them to have a business knowledge, to have business degree, but do, they should have a business attitude. They should have some uh, media plan, uh, marketing plan, and uh, target specific sites, tar target specific journalists, uh, uh, know when, how, and to whom write uh, and send this information. Um, so, but uh, don't you think that uh, we're kind of, uh, this may sound bad, but that we're kind of overestimating uh, the impact that media have on uh, sales and on games? on indie games, uh, to be precise. Because uh, you said that uh, to reach the media people, to reach journalists, uh, fans of the concrete genre, uh, is to build a great game. Well, in my opinion, this is the, the way to reach players. Right? If you want to reach players, you do a great game, and then if you're lucky and you, can, and you will go viral or something, um, you will be able to, to reach your target audience, and you won't need um, uh, you know, you won't need uh, you won't need to have a great exposure in in media and uh, a huge you know uh, so uh, net of contacts or whatever just to sell your game. Because in my opinion, uh, the the problem with casual games is that they're not interesting for uh, the game media, not not interesting enough, 
and they still sell because casual players, they don't search for their games through the media um, tools, through their journalists. They just, you know, browse the internet, they, they browse um, shelves, retail shelves and stores. So that makes, uh, in my opinion, um, the media impact for casual games kind of obsolete. I mean, we just have to do great games and that, that uh, should do it. I wanted to touch on that. Like, we all think of, of media as mainly the big outlets that are, that are out there. It changed. It changed. During the past two, three years, it changed immensely. Uh, one of the reasons why I ditched being a journalist was because of the V-bloggers who basically took over what, why, what, I, what I was doing for the TV. They do, this, do, they do the same, but they are way easier for an indie developer to access, to get to, get to, to talk to, and they have reach sometimes it surpasses the, the, the so-called big media in tenfolds. So I'd say that uh, keeping a good contact with, uh, with v-bloggers, with YouTubers, with uh, guys who stream, it's also a very good idea for, for, for you to kind of go into. So maybe, maybe some type of games don't need the, uh, any of press coverage at all. Maybe it's, it's, it's better to go directly to, to players or directly to, say, you know, to, to distribution channels. Well, uh, my friend who's, uh, who also works as an indie developer, he said that uh, you know, it's more important to, have to reach the store people, in the, I mean, uh, in the Google store, in the App Store, to have a relationship with uh, someone who's responsible for uh, developer uh, relations rather than uh, reach out to 100 journalists who receive thousands of emails every day. And, uh, because it may put an uh, indie developer off when uh, they you know, put their whole heart in uh, creating a press pack for, uh, for the media day, then they send it out and then it gets lost in this huge amount of spam you guys receive every day, so. I mean, right, the, the featuring on the store is the, the, the very most important thing you should take, a, take care about. So, I, I, I think you raised an interesting question just now about, do you, do you need the media? Um, yes, I, yes, I did. Uh, and and I, I, think it is, I think it's probably one, one of the most interesting questions today because the, having worked myself for the last three years in promoting mobile games, I think there's been a huge shift going on in terms of what marketing is and where PR fits into the scheme of things. And what I mean about that is there is almost no notion at the moment because it's an immature industry of brand marketing, of, of building awareness that doesn't result or have a direct result. So the, the, the easiest examples I can see of that happening are, you know, I was at an event recently and I was talking to two owners of large mobile games websites and they've seen huge drop off in sponsorship of site takeovers of skins of activities from game developers and publishers and the reason is simple because there, there's such an a, a myopic a singular obsession at the moment with paid for response-based advertising which absolutely will work for many people if you know what you're doing and has its place in the marketing mix and i say marketing mix because at the moment, there is very little concept of a marketing mix in the mobile industry. It's not like the console industry, which is very mature, and there's companies like EA that have year-long plans, and they've got print and television, and they've got desk side journalist briefings. None of that really exists. So I think the biggest challenge, just going back to your point about the role of the media, is I know from my perspective, clients... Have a, have a view, well, I'm going to get featured on Pocket Gamer or 148, and I'm going to hit top 10. Some magical thing is going to happen. And I think that's the wrong way to view the role of PR in mobile. And, it's, and PR in the mix has been seen like that by many other more mature industries for many years. It's just that the mobile games industry hasn't learned that yet. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think if you look at the, the games that have really blown up over the last few years, like Angry Birds and, and Flappy Bird and Candy Crush Saga, I don't think the media's had much to do with it. I think they've reinforced it after the games have become popular, but they become popular through other 
mechanisms, I think, through social media and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to the, the stuff about mastery games and the difficulty of getting casual games covered uh, by sites. I mean, I think I think there is a way. You know, if you if you emphasise to the the journalist that you're speaking to the, the differences, you know, what what it is that's special, why it's not just another clone, then then that's a valid approach. But also, I think you should be thinking about whether that you know whether you should be trying hard to pitch that to journalists because ultimately they're they're fundamentally not going to be as interested, and it possibly doesn't matter. Maybe. Facebook advertising or doing something else, you know, trying to push it through social media is actually going to work better for you than, than going through the media. Not, not that I want to discourage anyone from coming to the media, but um, I think with certain kind of games, other channels are likely to be more effective. Yeah, but uh, I, when think, I think YouTube is yeah. definitely really, really important now in terms of having people play your game and, and showing it and having commentary over the video and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a bridge between social media and traditional media because you can do outreach to YouTubers and say, will you cover this game? And if they like it, they'll say yes. And if they don't, they might say no or they might, or they might just make a really, really terrible review of your game just for the fun of it. So it's a risk, but... I think YouTube is definitely very important, and I think social media is really important as well, especially in mobile. I would say that streaming channels, I, I'm thinking Twitch, of course, because that's the biggest one, but I would say that streaming channels are also, they will be huge in a in, in few years. They will surpass YouTube even, I think, because it's, it's basically live television uh, that you have complete control of. And this is something that you can use both uh, as a kind of medium that you want to reach, but you can also produce your own show. You don't, you, you don't necessarily have to use media. You can become your own medium right now. So also for indie developers to make a stream and to show the, the, the gameplay, it's just like that. It's so easy. Why not do it? It's, it's cheap. It's effective. You, can, you, you are in the direct contact with the, with the people who are watching. So you can kind of brainstorm on the fly. You can brainstorm. You can, you can have their ideas put into your game. You can, it's kind of a... I'd say even something in common with Kickstarter. So basically, it's kind of a crowdfunding of ideas in the form of, of, of a video stream. So it's also one of the approaches that you could take. But uh, I, when I, you I, said uh, that you don't need actually media, I think you, uh, you meant uh, uh, hardcore gaming sites, yeah? Because it's uh, hard to see um, a review of uh, Hoppa Games uh, uh, exactly. between a review of <laughs> Battlefield and Call of Duty, yes? Yeah? So, exactly. And but uh, let me let me finish. Uh, you don't have to um, just uh, target your uh, message to a typical gaming site. For example, uh, if you create I don't know human story about you, about your company, about uh, Hoppa Games, for example, about mobile games, and send it to the um, mass media, to to the press, uh, try to convince them that this is a good topic. So. Uh. I concur. I mean, this is okay. This is also a, an idea on how to reach uh, the casual audience. But in my opinion, uh, the gaming media should, should also be about expanding uh, the, the game market, trying to expand it as far as we can. Uh, I still think that um, the gaming media, they miss out on the casual uh, audience not recognizing them as interesting. I mean, uh, the people you, you spoke about, like, I don't know, housewives or uh, any, other, um, any other person who doesn't play core games, they view uh, game media as not interesting. I mean, it's not something for me because I don't play that much, right? Yes, but we're so, still talking about um, a typical gaming site with um, topics uh, about uh, Call of Duty, Half-Life and uh, everyday news like we... Uh, well, like yeah, because uh, they, are for, they are for gamers, right? Well, in, from in, my in, point of view, um, I'm representing uh, Onet PL, which is uh, not uh, typical. In our site, it's not typical gaming section uh, like uh, Agree Online, like CD Action, and so on. So, uh, for example, um, we observe that uh, um, we have good uh, feedback from uh, our users, even if we sorry, write about um, casual. Could you, could you lift up your microphone a little bit? I just sorry. wanted to say sorry, that. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So uh, I observed that we g have good feedback from our users because we have uh, casual users. We have a large audience and only, uh, I don't uh, have uh, right numbers now, but uh, I don't know, 30% of them are hardcore gamers. The rest of them are just uh, casual players. 
browser, browser mobile, mobile play, players, browser games players. Right, so I have two more issues to, to cover. And first one, um, is it better to build your relationship with uh, media guys directly or work with a PR agency to do this work for you? So from a journalist's point of view, um, in terms of who we like dealing with, um, I, th I think I would, I would say there are advantages to using a PR person because there's recognition there and it's often someone we know and that's useful. And, and also if a game has been taken on by a PR agency that generally does good stuff, then it, you know, the game that you're promoting you know, is favoured by association. Um, but also I think there's the problem of you know, you're, just, you're just bundled in with a load of other games. So. It's, it, it, sometimes it's not quite as effective as having a direct relationship with a developer. Often developers, you know, we like to go to, we journalists generally like to go to, straight to developers because, um, because if they're kind of loose with their tongues and not particularly responsible in terms of PR, then we get the best, you know, information and stuff out of them. Um, but it, I think it very much depends on what your, your, your kind of skills are as a developer in terms of communication. I think using a PR agency is, uh, probably a good thing in most cases, I would say. Uh, and actually, on, on that note, um, I, I do, whenever we have a client who happens to have a very good relationship directly with a journalist, we always encourage them to go to the journalist directly because you want to nurture those relationships and you want to let them know when it's going to talk about a game as well as the developer is going to talk about a game. So you want that passion there. Um, I, I, I think, and I have a PR agency, so this might be somewhat biased, but the, one of the things that a PR agency is actually beneficial is in handling the sheer requests for review code or you know whatever it is. This isn't so much with mobile because um, Apple only gives 100 codes when you, when you get a game approved and, and Amazon really doesn't even have a code system, so it's a whole different ballpark, but just handling the logistics. That's a lot of what we do in PR, is just handling the logistics of figuring out who needs which codes and helping them get the helping them get the review code, the preview code, whatever it is, and then also following up and saying, what did you think about the game? Did you have any feedback? Are you going to post a review? Because journalists are absolutely inundated with review requests all the time. So obviously some things are going to fall through the cracks if they're not reminded of it. I don't know if this is correct. Uh, I'd say that there are pluses and minuses of using a PR agency. So from one side, you are kind of buying a complete solution. So somebody will take care of the stuff that you not necessarily know of and he'll do it professionally. But he will never know as much about the game as you do. He'll never have the passion that you just said. And actually, I would say that in the case of indie developers, the passion is what sells the game. Because you guys are doing the game out of your passion. You, sometimes you sacrifice most of your life just to make this game. So nobody will sell it better unless you are a very bad PR person. Like, then maybe you shouldn't do it. Like, but if you are good in contact with other people, the best, f from my perspective, the best thing would be try to reach the, the journalist by yourself and to sell it by yourself. Also, the, the, the private contact always is always beneficial. Like it's always, when you lose the, the, the middleman, it's always better for you. But on the other hand, you lose the whole professional side. So you lose the contacts, you lose the, the whole logistics that you, the, that you just said about. And of course, you lose money if you, <laughs> well, if you don't succeed. Back to the logistics thing, we, we launched a game last week and got something like 800 requests for review codes. So you need somebody who's going to go through those requests and make sure that it's not some made-up website um, that somebody who's just basically a journalist so that they can get free games, which unfortunately does happen. So you need to be aware of that. Yes. There is another, if I might say one more thing about it, because there's one more thing about uh, the little sites. In my opinion, it's super important to reach them. And it's very hard to do it with the PR agency, because PR agencies, they usually deal with the big media, big media outlets. They don't necessarily go to like somebody who has eight, 5,000 subscribers. And that's actually the grassroots that you need. So if you would like to, 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 to do the nice grassroots growth of your campaign, 
I would go also to the little outlets, to the little guys who just strive. They're in the same position as you, so they will help you because they want to, they want to profit as well. Of course, and I definitely agree with that. We work with small sites all the time, um, I, which I actually love working with small sites. But there are some sites out there that will take the name of a major publication and work it into their email address. Just and I mean, we've written to some of these publications because it's like such and such publication at Gmail. So we always write to the sites as well and say, is this someone who is representing you? And Oftentimes it's not, so it's something that is important. But obviously, yes, absolutely, you want to work with the small guys because they're the ones that have a lot of passion as well. I, I, think, I think also it depends on the agency. You know, there's a lot of hidden value that some agencies can, can bring beyond just dealing with the media directly. I can only talk from my experience, and Remy, you know, because I've worked with you a lot now. You know, we, the, for me, the launch is kind of a percentage of it. I spend far more time, I spent months with some clients giving them feedback on the game design. Things that you would not, I'm not saying we're wonderful and we do it, but I w you wouldn't necessarily expect a PR agency to do it. I help with writing in-game text. You know, sometimes a lot of developers, English is in their first language. It's about looking at the app store optimization, the keywords, helping select the screenshots. I spent hours with clients giving them examples about icons, about best practice for the App Store icon. So I think it's just really important um, when someone's looking at a PR agency. You, I've seen a lot of PR agencies for mobile games where they do a la carte services. And literally, you can go on the site, and it's completely fine say, for $250, I'm going to buy you write a press release. For $300, you're going to send it out to me. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. I think there's a hand-holding, a consultative, um, consult consultative aspect to it that we give as an agency, which is maybe not immediately clear until small indie developers start working with us. And so I just, I just think that's an important thing that can be recognized, the value some agencies can bring above and beyond the media relations. And just, just another really small thing is just going back to social media. I think that engaging with client customers at the grassroots level, like you said, not just, obviously there's the indie bloggers, but if you're going to start really getting into Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, I think it's so incredibly time-consuming and requires so much attention, knowledge, and passion. It is really only something that the game developer themselves can do, but the agency can help guide on a strategy and a plan for doing that and for best practice. But I think it would not be cost-effective for an agency to manage a Twitter feed. Well, at the end of the day, uh, it's the money that counts because as indie developers, we always uh, work on fixed budgets and they're not very, you know, huge. Uh, but I think it's, uh, if you can afford, well, uh, well, while designing the pipeline, the production, you should always save uh, some amount to work with a PR agency because I think uh, that uh, working with an agency saves you a lot of time. Uh, and actually can save you money because, because of the context that you spoke uh, before, because uh, of the, uh, the, the value, the input IPR agency may add to your game while on it. Um, and it gets it off your chest, so you can basically focus on designing the game, uh, writing the stories, or creating new ideas, new content, uh, and not uh, figuring uh, the, you know, uh, the relationship with... Uh, with media and the players, so you can right. focus on what's important for you. Yeah, and last okay. word to this discussion, yeah, from, from our point of view, from the journalist's point of view, it's not really important if we contact directly, directly with uh, developers. It's good to have direct contact with uh, developers, but if we are uh, contacted uh, via uh, PR agencies, it's okay, uh, if they are, of course, competent and responsive. It's not, just a final point, this is not something that's mutually exclusive. You know, in the, in the video games world, EA, Activision, Blizzard, they all have a sophisticated in-house PR team structure and they use established agencies and you work together. Normally, the in-house guys are coordinating the campaigns across country or might have direct relationships with some of the key media. But I don't think we should necessarily get into a mindset here that the two are mutually exclusive. Right, okay. So, I, it was a really interesting talk. This is... A uh, very complex, you know, topic, 
but as much important as, as, as the game itself. Having the game is only halfway through. The other halfway through is to let people know how the great the game is. I hope that our discussion answers some of your questions, but I think that the best way is just to try different approaches, try different solutions yourself. And that's always the, the best thing you can do. Cater the approach to the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. One thank last you. Word maybe for, 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 for the end. <coughs> English should be your main, uh, prefer most preferable uh, language. Uh, because um, if you compare, for example, last uh, day we have an um, interesting discussion during PlayStation Open Days uh, that uh, you should target uh, audiences abroad. Uh, you have comfort to create uh, this kind of product. Um, that has advantage over, for example, music or uh, movies. It's hard to uh, sell Polish movies or Polish music uh, abroad, even if uh, they try. But if you show, I don't know, real boxing to the guy from China or Brazil and uh, explain them how it's work, it, uh, they, it they know gets it. it quickly. Yeah. So you, <laughs> I think you, could, you totally agree. And it's uh, difficult for uh, Polish, I don't know, movie dev makers or uh, singers. They love to try sing in English and uh, they don't achieve global success. But you can because your product is easily understandable abroad. The country of origin is not important. And add goats to your game because it sells. Yeah, sure. <laughs>